Hello and welcome to this introduction to Christian Mission. I'm your host Benjamin Fagan and over the years I've amassed some interesting insights into witnessing and evangelism and missions. I have had years of experience in India teaching and preaching the gospel and sharing the wonderful faith, the wonderful Bible Seventh-day Adventist faith with people who know not Jesus Christ nor the truth. So I've had some experience. I want to share with you some insights that I have for missions and hopefully it gets you involved and get you impressed to reach out to those who do not know Jesus Christ and the special measures that we have. So let's get into it and let's take a look at what is all about here in our lesson. Let's take a look at the spirit of prophecy first and take a look. It says, there should not be a call to have settled pastors over our churches, but to let the life-giving power of the truth impress the individual members to act, leading them to labor interestedly to carry on efficient missionary work. You see, in Ellen White's time, too many of the Protestant pastors were hovering over the churches. And so today we shouldn't hover over churches, but we should reach out. Every church should be engaged in outreach and missional type of work in every locality. Um, our members are to be the Lord's devoted Christian workers. The church of today, that she, she wrote, the church of today is too one-sided. So we should never be too one-sided. We should never be so nurturing that we forget to reach out. Let's take a look some more. It says here, the proper, if the proper instruction were given, if the proper methods were followed, every church member would do his work as a member of the body. He would do Christian missionary work. But the churches are dying, and they want a minister to preach to them. So pastors are lead missionaries. Church members are missionaries to evangelists. But too many members are in this entertainment mode. We should not be in this entertainment mode seeking to be served in a consumer mentality, but we should go to serve others. As much as maybe I'm a pastor, but there's others out there, church members, who are to be engaged. You have a special anointing to share the truth. So please... If you're a member of a church, don't sit and just desire to be fed all the time, but put your faith into practice and feed others the truth of which you so hold dearly. So let's keep on looking here in the, in the lesson today. Instead of keeping the ministers at work for the church that already knows the truth, let the members of the churches say to these labors, go work for souls that are perishing in darkness. We ourselves will carry forward the services of the church. We will keep up the meetings and by abiding in Christ, will maintain spiritual life. We will work for souls that are about us. And so it's not God's plan for pastors to be constantly tending to church members who do not put their talents to use. A healthy church will encourage their pastors to do outreach, not just to hover and to nurture, but also to witness. A healthy church is one where the pastors also get to go and evangelize and spend time winning souls for Christ. They're not so involved and so, uh, so deeply entrenched in the actual church and nurturing that they cannot reach out. That, that's not the way it should be. This is an awesome quote. It says, the evangelization of the world in this generation. This was coined by J.R. Mott and the robust student volunteer movement in the 1880s and 1890s. The mission was evangelize the world in this generation. Now it's been many generations later. We still have not evangelized the world. Now, if you look at the English word evangelism or to evangelize, you have the gospel. The gospel is eugelion. And in the root there, you see angelos, which means a messenger. And it's about bringing good news. And so every Christian can deliver the good news. Everyone is to be a missionary and evangelist for Christ. The fear associated with the word evangelism is overcome by realizing Christians are sharing good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. You got good news to share. Don't be afraid to share it. There are main principles of mission. And these main principles, number one, always remember that missions involve both self-interest and self-sacrifice. We get involved in missions sometimes for self-interested reasons. We want to receive the prize. We want to win souls. We want stars on our crown. That's all right, and that's okay. We also have, the, uh, I think, one of the most important principles is self-sacrifice. We need to also be self-sacrificing, realizing as Christ sacrificed himself, we also should go the extra mile to help others. Paul is a good example of both. So you can read more on the slide later or pause it to read more on, this, on these points. The aim of a missionary is to preach the gospel. Their view is the salvation of souls, the establishment of the church, and the evangelization of the world. The objectives are the multiplication of disciples, leaders, and churches throughout the world. 
Two principles are wedded together in missions, in winning people. It's need and receptivity. These identify where to begin. There are four categories of needs. Four categories of needs. There are family, intimacy, vitality, and success. We must learn from the culture what people think they need and demonstrate to them in their own terms how Jesus can meet those needs. So when you take a look at these things, you want to address needs, those four needs, family, intimacy, vitality, success. And so when you're winning and soul winning and when you're trying to persuade someone to take up Christ and to become a Christian, what you want to address are those four needs, family, intimacy, vitality, success. Everyone wants to be successful. Everybody wants abundant life. Everybody wants friends and, and relationship, intimacy. And generally, everybody wants family. And in all four of these areas, or in some of these areas, life has failed some people. In other words, there's people who come from broken families, broken homes. They don't understand uh, their need or perhaps have never fully realized their need for family. And perhaps people are sick. They don't have that vitality. And so they're seeking vitality. And so you, as the missionary, can provide, um, can, uh, can, can help them with that need and help them satisfy their needs through presenting Jesus Christ and how he can meet those needs and presenting the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a way to meet those needs. Now, another um, section I want to go to is the laws of attitude change. So let's take a look at the laws of attitude change. The first law is change comes when old attitudes fail to meet today's needs. So if you're going to change someone's attitude, you've got to um, help them to see how their current belief system does not meet their needs. So you have to show how their current mindset does not meet their current needs. And you have to now into the second principle interject or the second law interject ambiguity. You know, basically saying, you may think this way, but you don't. You got it all wrong. Um, you have to insinuate doubt. You have to introduce doubt into their current belief system, and that's going to re going to require to know the person. You have to know the person, and you have to also know what religion they hold to. Are they atheist, agnostic? Are they uh, postmodern, secularists? Are they occultists? Are they Hindus, uh, Presbyterians? What are they? Right? You got to know what their belief system is and you have to know where in their belief system is their deficiency and interject doubt depending where um, the weakness in their faith lies. And then it'll lead them to ask questions and you'll be there then to facilitate the question and answer period and win their hearts over to the right side. There are different attitude levels. They're utilitarian, which is all about cost and benefits. So when you're trying to change an attitude, you want to increase the benefits of adopting the new system or belief and you want to lessen the um, the negatives or the costs. If someone decides to hold on to their current belief system which is wrong then you want to determine what is the high cost of that. Jesus said I'm the way the truth and life no one gets to the Father but by me. So by holding on to a wrong belief system and rejecting Christ you're losing out on eternal life. That's a cost. What do you get in return for accepting Jesus Christ? You get eternal life. And Jesus also said he came to bring abundant life, fullness of life. So you get eternal life and abundance of life with Jesus Christ. Sweet deal, right? Cost-benefit analysis. Except Jesus. That's one example, but you got to figure out in the belief system, okay? The next is ego-defensive attitudes. This is where people erect barriers to harsh realities. In other words, you give them a reality check. You show in their life, in their way, where there's a deficiency, and you give them a reality check. And sometimes individuals, when you give them a reality check, they put up a defensive barrier a wall. And then from that point on, it's like talking to the wall. They don't, they don't get it. They don't want to hear you. They don't even want to accept it. So when you address these ego defensive attitudes, just know it's one of the harder ones. I would better well stick with number one, the utilitarian. I think that's the easiest cost benefit analysis. And you may want to avoid the reality check uh, uh, perspective or approach. Next is value expressive attitudes. And they serve to clarify our self-image as well as to provide a way of moving our self-image closer to the self we desire to become. And so a good example of this one is, let's say you see a young person who's going to school. He wants to be a businessman. So he's going to university. He begins dressing like the businessman. He begins expressing a value that he has. What's his value? 
Well, businessmen are all about money and success generally. And so this individual is trying to express that they want success. That's one of the four needs that we talked about, right? And so you'll understanding, understanding how they're expressing themselves outwardly or by their words or their dress, it helps you understand where they're coming from and it helps you to address what need deep down do they want, do they want to satisfy. And so you want to address success. So if this person, let's say, it wants to be a businessman, well, you say, hey, look, you know what? There are many Christian um, businessmen who are very successful because they follow the principles of the Bible and they follow the God of the universe who owns all the cattle on all the hills. And so he can give you all the best of the world has to offer because Christ is the creator and redeemer of all mankind and this planet. And so you would frame it this way and it would introduce him. It might be introduce the, pr the person to Bible principles which would help them flourish in their business. That would be one way of meeting their need for success. And they may be more interested and ask you questions, you can give them answers and hopefully win their, win their hearts to Jesus. Next, next are knowledge function attitudes. These are formed to give meaning to our chaotic existence, but they're adopted. They're, strong, they're not often strongly held and they just come from our cultural heritage, from our context. They're ready-made attitudes that we just adopt until something better comes along. And so just because uh, I may have grown up in Canada and grew up in this environment, I've adopted some beliefs and some attitudes, which may very well could be wrong and damaging uh, any one of those four needs from stopping me from realizing any one of those four needs. And so your job as an evangelist or missionary is to help the person realize that there is something better to what they currently believe, helping them see that there is something better for them. Uh, from their current, currently held belief system or attitude, you have to show them something better. And you can go back again to the cost-benefit analysis or showing where there's a deficiency and showing them reality. Again, it's a little bit more difficult, that one may raise some barriers, but let the Spirit guide you there. When we go through persuasion, there's certain levels or certain uh, process that individuals go through. They go through the knowledge, they want to hear a new idea, they hear the new idea, they wrestle with the new idea, they come to a decision either to opt to or reject, they go into review where they mold the decision over, should I have, they go to an experiential where they're reassured that they're doing the right thing, they'll step out and practice the new innovation. And these five steps are what generally people go through in their mind when adopting a new attitude or belief. Back to the main principles of mission, we see we're all about evangelism. And evangelism strategy that is not guided by the principle of evangelism is not a missionary strategy. It's all about divine purpose and missions. It's not a strategy that seeks to dig wells to remote villages simply for the sake of providing clean water for people. It's a mission strategy that involves providing clean water so that the living water can be communicated to the people. It's not a strategy that seeks to provide bread for the hungry so that people will have food to eat. Rather, it's a mission strategy where one provides the bread of life. So I hopefully you're seeing sort of the step progression. So we provide the water, we provide the food as an opening wedge of sharing the real deal, what we really want to give, which is the bread of life, Jesus Christ, or the water of life, Christ and his doctrine. The bridges of God are social networks. We're social creatures. And so the gospel is actually designed to travel across social networks from people to people. And that's how God has established it. And what's fascinating is that I'm right now using a social bridge. It's called YouTube. And YouTube is actually a social community. Um, some people think that you just post stuff on the internet and it's just a post. This is not a post. This is a community, a social community. And hey, if you disagree or you agree with anything I've shared here today, put some stuff in the comments. Let me know. And let's have a talk. Let's have a discussion. And let's learn from each other and see what we, how we can grow as Christians. Now let's continue. Missionaries must work through pre-existing relationships to see the gospel disseminated. So it's a person, it's a relationship thing. Now, the West versus East. In Western Earth, you have highly individualistic mentalities, like in North America. And then there's high group consciousness societies, like over in India, in the East, or in Asia. And it's all going to change how we approach things. We should be guided by simplicity, not complexity. So keep things simple. Avoid paternalism. Always have an exit strategy no matter where you start out. And always give power and control back to the people you're witnessing to. And help them to establish their church and their leading. Missionaries are to strategize for their departure before they enter the place of service. So it's not an afterthought. It should be before. 
and identify with the locals and become a bicultural person. What does it mean? It means that if you're in India, you should, according to biblical principle, making sure you can adopt the dress, maybe adopt the hairstyle, um, try to be like them. But of course, don't go so far as to become, uh, to become going into sin, like following their same sins. No, no, we don't want that. But you want to adopt the culture as far as you can without compromising biblical principle so that they can connect with you and you can connect with them. It's sort of, it works both ways. By adopting their cultural, uh, cultural perspectives and their ways, maybe dress or talk or accent or hairstyle, it helps people better connect with you. So that's one thing I would suggest. Become a bicultural person. This is an interesting quote by Ralph Winter. He says, I'm afraid that all our exaltation about the fact that every country has been penetrated has allowed many to suppose that every culture has been penetrated. Uh, this is an interesting quote, and I'm going to just flesh this out a little bit further. Um, it's pretty important. And so when you look at it, many Christians and many churches are in the world, and there are some places in the world where the gospel is yet to be preached. And the gospel still is yet to take root in some cultures. Um, even though North America is filled with uh, different, is filled with a lot of different people, and all these different people have something to offer the world. And when you look at all these different cultures, yeah, like not all of them know Christ as best as they should. Um, Ralph Winter he gave a plenary address at the Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization. And this, and this quote comes from where he challenged the participants to strategize to bring the gospel to the thousands of unreached people groups. And these unreached people groups are called UPGs in the world. And he basically reminded the Congress that the Greek word translated nations in Matthew 28, 19 actually means ethnic groups. So we may have like churches in North America and churches all over the world, but have we basically reached every culture? Like, for example, in Africa, there's only some tribes that have heard the gospel, and other tribes have not heard it. They've not heard about Seventh-day Adventism, even. And so, yeah, there might be churches in Africa and churches in different countries of Africa, but not in every cultural group. And so this is something that we need to address and keep in mind. A missionary strategist is like a spiritual doctor. And spiritual doctors, they strategize. They examine their patients. And so as you and I, as a missionary and evangelist, we're supposed to take basically a whole patient outline of the culture we're dealing with, figuring out where are they healthy? Where are they failing in health? Diagnosing their problems and providing the solution like a doctor would. Each people group requires a unique strategy. In order to develop a unique strategy, missionaries need to understand their people group thoroughly. How can a doctor be successful if they don't know their patient? and don't know them thoroughly. You gotta take their blood, you gotta take their temperature, find out their breathing and heart rate, all in order to understand their health. And that's what we have to do is, as evangelists and missionaries. There's a 10-step planning model for um, developing a, uh, a, a patient chart for the culture you're dealing with. You wanna define, or have a definition of the mission, that is, what will the effort attempt to accomplish for your patient, for your people group? You want to attempt to understand the people in their culture. Decide on the missionary force. What kind of people, what kind of skills do you need? Like a surgeon needs a team. You need to ascertain what methods and means can be used to effectively end the region. And with this knowledge, allow the missionary group to establish approaches that promise an opening. You want to anticipate the results. Decide about roles. And once the roles are decided, define in detail your plans. Decide on the place and the plan so carefully, and then you formulate that and get it all into motion. And then you evaluate what has been done. Has it been effective? You need to answer that question. Now, when we're talking about unengaged people groups, we need to identify the UPG. And then we need to commit to engaging that unengaged people group. Appoint a strategy and coordinator. You want to enlist prayer support, recruit a team of missionaries, learn the language and culture, develop a people group profile, and that's called the PGP, evangelize the people using their heart language, plant churches, train the leaders, and implement an exit strategy. And that exit strategy should be figured out beforehand before you go into the group. A PGP 
It's the International Mission Board's uh, devising. It's a profile of the way the people within a specific culture live, act, think, and work, and relate. It's a map of the culture's social, religious, and economic and political views and relationships. It's just like when you're a surgeon or you're a doctor and you basically get like a scan of someone's brain or scan of someone's body. And so as the missionary, you're do basically doing like an environmental scan or a cultural scan or a religious scan or all those things to get a perspective with the group that you're working with and to figure out what their problems are and how you can address their needs to share with them the gospel. Like building the well because they don't have clean water so you can share with them the living water. As you've seen that, number one, everybody needs Jesus, everybody needs the truth, and number two, well, they need clean water. So give them the clean water and make a way for you to get into their homes and their, um, their temples, so to speak. Here are some information you can take from, and you can take a screenshot and mark these things down. I'm going to quickly go through these slides so that you can just note it. And then you have here, the living conditions, society, children, youth, the religious landscape. And as you go through the religious landscape, don't forget to decide and to figure out what would be some redemptive analogies you can use. The redemptive analogy is basically the practice or belief uh, native to in a given culture that parallels or illustrates the gospel. The peace child, I don't know if you've, got, if you've heard of this before, but the peace child is a term used in redemptive analogies. And redemptive analogy refers to the practice or belief native to any given culture. And so in this uh, particular culture, the Sawai tribe of Western New Guinea, Indonesia, they believed in what was called a peace child. And two native families, what they would do is they would trade children in order to solidify a peace treaty. It was hard for both families to exchange their sons. And so these are called peace children. So the idea was well, you gave your child as a trust to the other, an exchange. And so when that exchange happened, there was a pact of peace that they no longer fight and kill each other. It was now a solidification of peace. I gave you my child, you give me yours. We take care of both in mutual respect and love for one another. To say enough fighting, we're taking care of each other's people now. It means that we can now trust each other. The one who gives the peace child has the ability to educate all grievances. They act as advocates for the people. And true peace could never come without a peace child. The missionary, uh, Don Richardson, related the gospel in connection with the peace child. The tribal people began to view Judas uh, not as a hero in the gospel story, but as a villain because he committed what was called terop or terap gaman, which is the worst thing that anyone can do, a betrayal of taking a peace child, yet still um, committing uh, murder, uh, still breaking that peace treaty. And that's essentially um, how it was communicated to the people. The peace child relationship or the peace child compact had been broken with what Judas had done. As God had given Jesus Christ uh, to make peace with the world, the Prince of Peace to make peace with the world, Judas ended up killing that peace child, that, that Jesus Christ, through what he did, the betrayal. So that's, a, that's just something to know. Think about redemptive analogies. Now this is a funny picture because this is what happens when you go to see a psychiatrist or a therapist. And so the idea here is, well, not therapists or something, but by conducting interviews and asking questions, like a therapist would act their, ask their patient, a researcher can understand the people group's morality, how they judge right from wrong, further questioning can uncover their beliefs about what is true, and their worldview. So you gotta ask questions, you gotta ask lots of questions. And so there's some keys to developing a good strategy. You wanna look at these seven areas. So they're on the slide, you can take a picture and take a note. And so why bother? Why bother developing a profile? Well, a profile will establish a foundation for understanding the culture and how people will comprehend. The profile highlights contrast between people's culture and Christianity. The profile reveals issues that the missionary may not have noticed in, the, in doing a superficial review. And the profile will provide the missionary with lists or of barriers and bridges to evangelism. The profile will help the missionary understand which biblical doctrines to emphasize in the teaching. It will aid the missionary in determining the learning objectives. 
And if the missionary is doing Bible storying, then the profile will help the missionary choose the best Bible stories that speak to their issues. The profile always will enlighten the missionary to help them learn, and the profile will enable the missionary to plot the people group's position on the learning scale and the receptivity scale, and the profile will help the missionary avoid syncretism among the new believers. I like this quote here, the missionary nature of the church. It says, missionary work reflects in a unique way, particularly in its passing boundaries in space and spirit, the very essence of the church as a church. It returns, as it were, to its origin and is confronted with its missionary calling. It is exactly by going outside of itself that the church is itself and comes to itself. And so the, the church should exist to reach outside of itself. That's the main point. So a church should not just nurture its own self, but seek to nurture the world. Universal elements of church planting movements. So as you're developing a church plant, think about these things. It involves prayer, lots of evangelism, intentionality, uplifting the authority of scripture, local leadership, and house churches. And as you apply these things, just know that these are important, that you should never forget them. Now, another universal elements are churches planting churches. So they should uh, re replicate, churches should grow and multiply. There should be rapid production and leadership by lay persons, not by the missionaries themselves all the time. It leads to basically this um, paternalism. It's unhealthy. And healthy churches carry out the basic functions of a church. Worship, evangelism, missions, discipleship, fellowship, and ministry. And then in preparation for planting, we should consider these things. Make a list of churches of that community or temples and stuff so you know. Interviewing the leaders of these churches and asking them how many active members they have, how many there are from the community that surrounds the church, and visit the, these churches to find something about the groups that are not being reached, the worship styles and the ministries that are working and that are not. So it's key. In preparation for planning, you should ask the question, what are some of the needs of this community? Why do so many people in this community not attend church? What type of activities in the church do you think would help you and your family to deal with the problems of life? And if we were to start Bible studies to help the families in this community, would you be interested in attending? So it's all a process and preparation. Then as we look at church activities and follow the Acts plan, Acts chapter 2, you'll find this, um, this chapter goes through um, how we should engage in evangelism with the church. It indicates that the message of salvation is to be proclaimed, people who receive the word to be baptized, New believers are preserved in the Apostles' Doctrine and the breaking of bread and prayer, so the ceremonies and things, and the activities. Uh, the passage also, verse 43 in Acts 2, shows that there's, there was tangible evidence of God among them. So there's got to be evidence of that. You should see a spirituality, pervasive. You should see people ministering to the needs of others, worshiping and developing in the uh, church and in the homes. Uh, you should be found in favor with all the people and experience the Lord's adding daily to the church. So the church should be growing if you're seeing a really healthy church. And it should also be um, one that's all very spiritual and very, neat, uh, very successful at meeting people's needs. The church remains God's strategy. God's purpose still requires His plan. And God's people must be spirit-led to really succeed as a missional church. I like this quote from Education from Ellen White. Here, the prophet calls upon us to look at the good examples from the past and use their techniques that were fair, that worked, and that made sense. I'm not going to say that everything the past people did was right, but there are good principles that we can take from individuals who worked in missions in the past. And we need to be guided by good, solid biblical principles in harmony with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. John L. Nevius, he lived in 1829 to 1893. He was a Presbyterian missionary to China, and he further developed the indigenous principles of Venn and Anderson in his classic book, Planting the Development of Missionary Churches. Here, Nevius, he shares his principles, and I've outlined them here on this slide. So you see the two principles. Christians should continue to live in their neighborhoods and pursue their occupations, being self-supporting, witnessing to their co-workers and neighbors. Number two, missions should develop only programs and institutions that the national church desires and can support. 
His third principle, national churches should call out and support their own pastors. Church buildings should be built in the native style with money and materials given by the church members. Fifth, intensive biblical and doctrinal instruction should be provided for church leaders every year. Allen, Roland Allen, he lived from 1868 to 1947, and he served as an Anglican missionary in China from 1892 to 1904. Like Nevius, he faulted the methods employed by most missionaries in China, and he expressed his indigenous strategy most fully in two books, The Missionary Methods, St. Paul or Ours, and The Spontaneous Expansion of the Church, he published in 1927. Allen, he, this is some of his principles here, Roland Allen. Number one, all permanent teaching must be intelligible and so easily understood that those who receive it can retain it, use it, and pass it on. Number two, organizations should be set up so that the national Christian can maintain them. And number three, church finances should be provided and controlled by the local church members. The local churches should be supported financially through the church members' tithes and offerings. And that's important to know. His fourth and fifth is that Christians should provide pastoral care for one another. The people of China often suffered from famine, brought on by doubt and floods, and so it needed church members to look after each other. Number fifth, missionaries should give local believers the authority to exercise spiritual gifts freely and at once. And the Holy Spirit has used people all the time. We shouldn't restrict others. And as we look at the indigenous church, we have to define it. Uh, an indigenous church means a church from the, uh, from the area, uh, coming up from the area. In Verdict Theology, Alan Tippett proposes a six-fold description of an indigenous church. So you can look at this, self-image, self-functioning, self-determining. Fourth, self-supporting, self-propagating, self-giving. Let's take a look at women in missions. Ruth A. Tucker wrote, Opportunities for women were, were and are restricted in the institutional church, at home, and mission leaders because of their compulsion to reach a lost world for Christ have been less restrictive than church leaders in this respect. And so from the very beginning, Protestant missionary movement, women played a significant role. Initially, they were prayer warriors, promoters, fundraisers, and missionary wives. Later on, they became active leaders in mission. Women are important to missions. They had undergone such miscarriages and all kinds of problems. Now, the person you see on the screen is Mary Slessor. Mary Slessor, she was a really wonderful woman. She threw herself into ministry. She supervised schools, gave medicine. She had mediated disputes. She had mothered unwanted children. She pioneered all kinds of projects. She was a preacher. She was all this wonderful Scottish missionary who lived from 1848 to 1915. She was a United Presbyterian missionary, did so much. Another woman in ministry is uh, Amy Carmichael. She was a devoted missionary in India, and she had spent 55 years serving young women and children. She rescued young girls and founded the Donovar Fellowship. She was actually born in Belfast, Ireland, and to a devout family of Scottish ancestry. Uh, Carmichael, she was educated at home in England, where she lived with the, uh, with the family of Robert Wilson after her father's death. While never officially adopted, she used uh, the hyphenated name Wilson Carmichael as late as 1912. Her missionary call came through contacts with the Keswick movement. In 1892, she volunteered to the China Inland Mission, and she just blossomed from there and spread out into, uh, into other places, especially in India. That's where she was most devoted, as I said before. So I'm sharing these women in ministry so I can give any woman who's watching some ideas uh, in order to develop their own mission and help their church with uh, expressing the love of Christ to others. Let's look at uh, another one. Next one is some men in ministry, Boniface. Boniface was a unique individual. He spent 40 years evangelizing the indigenous peoples of Germany who are animistic in their worship. So also note the time frame. We're going way back in time here with Boniface. He used power encounter, which is followed from many missionaries even today. It's a little bit scary because it means maybe destroying some idols like Boniface did. He's a famous missionary, Winfred Boniface, and he spent 40 years evangelizing the peoples of Germany. Uh, Boniface, he tried to reform the corrupt Frankish church, but he didn't succeed. 
uh, what he really managed to do was to change hearts and minds through power encounters. And he tried to reform many things, but he wasn't successful. He actually did this uh, crazy thing. Uh, to some people, it would be crazy. He gained fame by chopping down the sacred oak. And that's what you see in this picture. It's Boniface taking the, act, uh, taking the axe to the sacred oak of Thor and uh, Geismar and Hes. He focused first on the upper classes. His approach was to win the wealthy and influential. He took the beliefs of people seriously and he communicated in a way that they understood. And he was very enthusiastic at recruiting women into missions. So that's something that made him very popular too. He was letting women engage in outreach. He was someone who was also uh, very good at winning people of influence and of power in the places he went. The next one is, I couldn't find a good picture for, for Christian. Christian Kaiser, he basically, he was, uh, gave a lot of Christian instruction and he looked at baptism as a thing to be reserved for those who demonstrate fidelity over a long period of time. He was someone who really wanted clear-cut conversion for all. Uh, in 1920, Kaiser went to Germany with his family and he was not permitted to return to New Guinea because of the political situation during and after World War I. He worked on his ethnographic and linguistic data and published a dictionary of the uh, Ket language in 1925. In 1929, he uh, was awarded uh, the honorary doctorate for his scientific achievements. Uh, so this man is very, very, um, uh, very well uh, known in missions, and he did a lot for missions. So just keep in mind, as I'm going through these um, individuals, I hope you're getting some ideas and being encouraged to share and become a witness for Christ. I like this, uh, this quote from uh, Mr. Count Nicholas von Zeisendorf. He said, My joy until I die is to win souls for the Lamb. And he lived from uh, May 1700 to May 1760. He was a German religious social reformer, bishop of the Moravian Church, and founder of the uh, Hernrother Bruder uh, Gunmein, uh, Christian mission pioneer he was, and a major figure of the 18th century Protestantism. Now, he played a big role, uh, starting in Protestant mission movement, by supporting two determined Moravian missionaries. He supported uh, Johann Dober and David uh, Nischmann uh, to go to the Danish colony of St. Thomas via Copenhagen to minister to the enlist enslaved population. And they were uh, Moravian slaves. Uh, Zeisendorf was critical of slavery, and he supported the first Moravian missionaries who, in spite of Danish royal support from Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Amalie of Denmark uh, faced discouragement from some Moravians and uh, he, he, he went on and he pushed through. He, um, he helped out and he led people to Christ. He was a very powerful, very influential man. Zeisendorf, he spent 30 years as an overseer of worldwide network of missionaries. His missionaries were self-supporting lay people who were trained as evangelists. Um, they witnessed by conversations and by living example. He viewed people as equals, not superiors. Um, he, didn't, he didn't view himself, his missionaries, as superior people, but as equals with people. His message was always the love of Christ, and same with his missionaries, the same. Um, doctrinal truths for him were supplied after conversion. So the idea for him and his main thrust was get people converted. Convert people, convert people, convert people, and then lay doctrine on them later. Now, we can may find some critical, um, some people may be critical of this approach. Some people say, no, 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 doctrine first. We have to teach them, teach them, teach them. But for him, it was about opening their hearts. Get their hearts first, capture their hearts, then lay the teachings on them. That was his approach. Theodore. Theodore was another missionary, an important missionary, uh, he was a pietist pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church. And when he arrived in New Jersey in 1719, he was appalled at the unbelief and poor morals he observed among his church members. And so he began aggressive evangelism and nurturing of his church. And he exhorted them to live committed lives. And he was just a, a very itinerant preacher, one who was trying to gain the con conversions in his own church and those outside. Next one is Jonathan Edwards. He actually, a lot of his work um, he, as a congregational church pastor was one to visit people and challenge people with his sermons. He was always calling people to repent and to commit. 
And that was his approach. George Whitfield is another important minister. Um, he was the, the leading light of the First Great Awakening, some would say. While uh, Tennant and uh, Theodore ministered only in the middle colonies, and Jonathan Edwards in New England, George Whitfield preached up and down the east coast of the American colonies. His ministry unified the awakening in America and connected it to evangelical revival in Great Britain. George Whitfield was a large man with a booming voice, and so he was a persistent preacher, he was powerful, he boomed with his voice, and he emphasized personal conversion always. Another individual, or another group I should say, are the Methodist lay preachers. Every time the Methodist lay preachers went out, they communicated passion for Christ, and they lived it. They preached grace for sinners and free will of the people to choose who they wanted to serve. Every Methodist lay preacher was to do four things in their sermons. To convince, to offer Christ, to invite, and to build up. They were to do every, all four in every single sermon. Now, there are two keys to Methodist success. The first two is the, 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 the first one is extraordinary sacrificial commitment to the mission. And number two, expansion and assimilation. That's what their structure was all about. And these volunteer preachers were assigned to circuits and they would go around preaching and teaching. This is what they would do. So th note those two methods, two keys for success. Next are the Baptist farmer preachers. They had this contagious enthusiasm that when they spoke and when they lived, people just wanted to follow. They had this simple gospel message, emotional preaching, and they had this flexible polity. They preached hell is hot and heaven is sweet, and they had no patience with ambiguity or spiritual neutrality. And you know, for them, a person either followed Christ or they followed the devil. It was black and white. It's either this way or that way. Choose which side you're on. It was a very straightforward and powerful message that they preached. The next group are the Quakers, and I use them as a bad example of what not to do so that we can do what's right. The Quakers, they set a new standard in their relationship with Native Americans, and they did not have much success among the Indians because of their exclusivist meetings. Their failure was being too distinct and having their very exclusive meetings, which were not welcoming to outsiders. And so here we can learn from their failure by being inclusive and welcoming of other people. Now the French Jesuits, now these people were committed to mission, and they identified with tribal people. In some ways they became very bicultural people. They mastered the language of the natives, and they had a willingness to pursue their goal, even to extreme ends. Now, I do not support the Jesuits and their spirituality and their message, but some of their tactics worked, and we do well to learn from them. But let's not copy everything they say and do in their methods altogether. The Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was a successor of the notorious Roman Inquisition, and they just promoted this theological orthodoxy, and they wanted to protect those accused of failure in this regard. The Roman Inquisition was an agency established in 1542 to combat heresy, specifically to combat Protestantism. They involved themselves politically and militarily to attack Protestantism and to end it. That's what they were all about. And the Jesuits, when they went into the Native Americas, they began inoculating Amazon Indians against smallpox in the 1720s. Jesuit missionaries would give Huron smallpox blankets and those who would refuse to convert uh, basically what happened was they gave smallpox blankets and killed thousands of people. This is something that we should never ever ever idolize or ever ever follow. We don't hurt people and make them sick because they don't convert. That's terrible. We also we always need to have the right motivations for missions. We don't want to attack people and make them sick when they don't follow our way. That's wrong, very wrong. We always want to have compassion and meet human needs. Present the love of Christ. And the love of Christ is to compel us. That's the right motivation. Compassion is a character mark of our missionary God, who so loved the world that he gave his only son. Though Erasmus had argued for civilization as the task of missions, later he wrote of a pure desire to see souls freed from Satan's tyranny and one for the Redeemer. 
love is the leading passion. Compassion with the temporal and eternal fear of the heathen was among the motivations for mission amongst the Dutch reformers. We can keep on reading about the Lutherans and Calvinists. Eventually, love of God prevailed. Early Puritan missionaries such as John Eliot and the Pietists of the 17th and 18th centuries were motivated primarily by compassion and a joy to witness. John Wesley gave little attention to hell and judgment in contrast to George Whitfield, both emphasized the universal love of God. Salvation of souls was absolutely central, and that should be the same way for us. Visions of unbelievers perishing for eternity apart from Christ were not uncommon in sermons. The whole idea was, don't let them die, go out, win souls. And there was an interesting thing here um, in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, at the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, uh, in the USA in 1803, there was a sermon that was proclaimed, and it says this. I'm going to read it for you. Suppose in that dreadful day, some miserable condemned pagan, just ready to sink into the eternal flames, should turn his despairing eyes upon you and exclaim in a voice that shall rend your heart, Why, why did you not warn me of this day? Sermons in promotional literature emphasize the great urgency in bringing the gospel to people who would otherwise perish without it. Statistics were calculated for how many people were perishing by the year, month, day, and hour, and minute. The whole idea of love for souls, win them before they die, before it's too late. And let me tell you, friends, time is running out. People are perishing without Christ. What are we doing for them? The, another motivation for mission was obedience to Christ's command, go and win hearts. We hear the Apostle Paul claiming to be under obligation to and entrusted with the gospel and to share it. We need to have a mission-minded church. And missions is another line, item. It should never be just a line item on a budget, but it should be a lifestyle in a church. A right motivation for mission is divine calling or an inner compulsion to do what is right. And here on this slide you can see about Paul and his missionary calling. And it should be the same way for us. We should feel called and feel compelled to witness. Last one is doxology for the glory of the Lord. Christ himself entered the world becoming a servant so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. And a few verses later, Paul writes that, the con that he considered his mission to the Gentiles an offering to God. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Thus, worship is the fuel and the goal in missions. It's all about worship. So I hope you don't miss it. We have the wonderful ability to worship God, where others don't know how to worship Jesus Christ. And so we have the opportunity to share the worship of God so that others may join us in elevating Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That should drive us to mission, shouldn't it? There's the eschatological motivation with a view of the end. The church announces the coming kingdom to the world, and we should do that too. The strongest motivation for sacrificial love and courageous witness of the church before the world is this. Gotta share that we love God. Gotta share the gospel so that the end can come quickly. Towards the end of the 19th century, people began to lose compassion and concern for the lost. It became more about the standard of living, ignorance, and temporal needs. It became more worldly, I think. Missionaries should always use reproducible methods of evangelism and in teaching and preaching and all that good stuff. Missionaries should view themselves as temporary church planters rather than permanent pastors. You're supposed to work yourself out of a job. That's the idea. The big no-no in missions is syncretism, and it's a combination of two or more religions or cultures. Uh, we must pay attention to cultures and worldviews. And when missionaries don't pay attention, you get folk Christianity being born. And what that is is that it's when Christians identify themselves as Christians, but their worldview and lifestyle just remains unchanged. In other words, they're just cultural Christians or cultural Adventists. They go to church on Sabbath, but beyond that, that's about it. They live as the world does and live like the pagans outside. And that should not be the way. That's folk Christianity. If we take a look here. Local folk religions are composed of traditional activities and religious practices that are created by humans trying to find God. Folk religions often compromise the demands of the gospel and add some often ridiculous requirements about, for salvation. Uh, there are two ways to recognize folk religion. The first, look for religious practices that are too exclusive or too inclusive. So extremes, look for extremes. Second, discover the religious practices that rely on outward activity instead of inward change. 
the influence of folk religion is very common in North America and others. And so there's, uh, we need to keep these things in mind. Contextualization is important. We have to be aware of folk religion, and we have to know how to identify it. When we go into a church or a religious setting, identify folk Christianity. Now, there's lots of folk religion outside of Christianity. There's folk Hinduism, folk Islam, you could say too, where the world is too far blended with the religion, where it becomes indistinct, and perhaps extremes on either end, too inclusive, too exclusive. You find this uh, across religions, not just Christianity, the folk aspect. Contextualization means relating the never-changing truths of Scripture to ever-changing human context. So we have to be good at doing this. Contextualization is necessary for several reasons. First, whenever the gospel is presented, it is presented in cultural clothing. Evangelicals, they root their theology in the Bible, God's unchanging eternal world. But only the Bible itself is God's actual revelation of this truth to humankind. Every explanation of the gospel passes through the experience of the person who is sharing it. And that understanding of the gospel is inevitably colored by the person's own culture and personal background. So context means everything, and we got to realize that there's good contextualization and bad. The good avoids syncretism and maintains true to gospel principles and standards. The gospel is presented, the second uh, point is I want to bring up is that when the gospel is presented in ways that ignore the local context, much of the culture and life remain unaddressed by biblical truth. Many practices thought and thought patterns from the old culture and religion are compartmentalized or go underground. Uh, nominal responders to the gospel accept Christianity on a superficial level, but their core worldview basically will remain unchanged. And many of uh, their uh, old unbiblical practices will continue secretly. So it becomes like underground paganism with an outward Christian form. We avoid that. It's terrible. Okay, it needs to. We need to have inward change, inward life change. Uh, there's other points, but I don't want to get bogged down here. So let's move on. So we got to make it plain. Contextualization involves not making the message of Scripture comfortable, but rather speaking clearly to all areas of a context, which means beliefs, values, emotions, BVE. So when we do contextualization, include look at beliefs, values, and emotions. Good contextualization, good contextualization offends people for the right reasons. So we want to offend for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons, not to be rude, obnoxious, and terrible. Okay. Um, contextualization involves not making the message of Scripture comfortable, but rather speaking clearly to all areas of a context. Uh, Andrews Walls, he observed, the gospel should be presented in such a way that believers in Jesus Christ are both at home in their new culture and speak prophetically in their context. So good contextualization will do both. It will speak the message of Scripture into the deepest needs and aspirations of the context. It will speak in ways that stir emotions and stimulate thinking. And at the same time, it will challenge people. It will challenge people and stir them to change. Stir them. And it may very well disturb them. A good message should disturb you a little bit. It should lead you to change and be challenged. It should lead you to uh, it should look you to, it should make you critically evaluate your values and your long-held assumptions to see if they're even right. And once we have that reality check, we got to make the change. Next, make it plain, the offense. There is absolute truth, and some cultural practices are inherently sinful and should not be carried on. There's a need for adapting to cultural practices for the sake of the gospel. There's need. If we look at some critical contextualization principles, the first and second, um, let's, let's, not, let's not get back down and bug down here, but just take a look. Look at these steps and consider them when you do contextualization. The third step is here. Local Christians should meet and evaluate their traditional customs in light of scriptural teaching. And the fourth step, and it's the last one, involves implementing the decisions made by the body of believers. Again, if you want to read more into this, the the, the picture will be on the slide for the fourth step. This is the last step. So now if we keep on looking, we have the contextualization here. Again, some steps for critical contextualization. We want to take an exegesis of the culture to make sure that the full meaning and implications of the practice that's being practiced are understood. You want to understand their old ways and not to judge them. And you need to take a look at scripture which helps us to understand the truth and see if whether or not a practice can be maintained or kept. 
you'll need to take a critical response either to keep or reject the practice or to modify it to make it uh, palatable and right with in harmony with the truth. And you, and you need to implement it, right? You need to make it a contextualized practice. This is a figure for responses to traditional practices. And this is adapted from uh, Hybert and Menezes. So this is something you can look at. It's a little bit of extra detail. The next one we're going to look at is some catalysts for successful mission. Secular developments such as the French Revolution and industrialization, the abolition of the slave and opium trades, and European colonial expansion fostered a viral manifest destiny and evangelical triumphalism. And in this religious realm, the gospel was allowed to be spread. There was a free church and there was a big spread. So as this secular stuff was happening and these major changes in society happened, it facilitated the spread of the gospel. So sometimes what's going on in the culture allows us and opens up the way for the gospel to spread. So sometimes culture or government or environment can be a catalyst for mission. So you got to be opportunistic and see when there's an advantage. Take up the advantage and get the gospel out there. Right now, one of the advantages that we have is the internet, YouTube. So while Christians can post on YouTube, do it. Get it out there. Get the word out. This is an advantage. This is where culture and technology is helping us spread the gospel. So take advantage. It's a catalyst. What can be done about public uh, perceptions? You want to get out of the religious ghetto into mainstream secular media. You need to increase community involvement by the organization, not the individuals. Um, for Adventists, we need to establish public service and public affairs agencies in major uh, city areas and make contributions that gain media attention and get that street cred. So now Adventists don't become some weird uh, small group or some group that's unknown. They become a well-known group for good things. And there's some strengths there on our, on our slide too to take a look at. And so let's take a look at how we share the everlasting gospel. Our actions speak louder than our words. And this is a spark of awareness or interest in what we have to share, creativity or personality behind our words. Uh, likely we'll never convince someone if we don't have that spark. We don't have that personality and creativity that draws people. People want to hear an excited testimony. Uh, they want to hear excitement. They want to hear that the truth has been made real in a human heart. And actions are the first level of Christian witness. You are a living letter, read and known of all men. A really ineffective communication results from double messaging that leave others perplexed as to how we really feel. If I say one thing and do another, the actions will speak louder than words. If we send double messages, people will believe our actions before they believe our words. Everything we do will either underscore or negate our message. Just common sense. There are two basic components of credibility. Perceived integrity or character and authoritativeness or expertise. So when we are sharing a message, we have to basically uh, determine, we have to share or, or, or solidify these things. Number one, guard your character, guard your, your character, guard your integrity. That's so, you know, don't, if you're a pastor or a leader or whatever, don't be engaged in adultery, don't sleep around, don't swear, don't curse, because people will hear your words, they'll hear what you've done, and they won't trust you anymore. You'll have no credibility. You'll have no character credibility. The next thing is expertise. Educate yourself. For example, you may say, why am I listening to this pastor right now? Well, number one, I'm a pastor. Number two, I have a master's degree in uh, religious studies and my major was missiology. So I'm educated and I have experience in India doing uh, missions and evangelism there uh, in a bicultural context, or actually multicultural context because there's so many different contexts in India. Uh, so that's my expertise. So I bring expertise to the table. I, I bring character to the table. As far as I'm, I haven't, I haven't done anything crazy awful, and I, I'm married to one wonderful wife. I have uh, a wonderful daughter. Um, you know, I'm faithful to my family, and I preach the gospel and I live the truth because I love Jesus, and I never want to hurt him. And so this is this is the point. Guard your character. Have develop some expertise. Get educated. Get experience. A receptor is someone who receives a message. So we want receptive receptors. And so we need receptor-oriented communication. So you need to make your ideas as understandable, as simple as possible. Make it so simple. Make your communication so simple that a child can understand what you're saying. Craft shares these major points on how to communicate. You need to be perceived by that person as being aimed, your message being aimed at him personally. 
You need to frame your message in the context that the person shares with you. You need to be perceived by that person as coming. Uh, the, the message needs to be perceived by that person as coming from a credible source. The message needs to be illustrated for that person in a way that is believable. And the message needs to be understood, accepted, and believed. Right? That's the great pointers there for communication. People screen. Jesus said, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But how many real truth seekers have you ever met? Most people are balance seekers. They are trying to make up their minds. And when their minds are made up, they say, well, don't bother me. They think, don't bother me. I know it. People, when faced with disagreeable information, screen. They want to screen out what is disagreeable. Literacy level is important. Oral communicators are illiterate, functionally illiterate and semi-illiterate, and they receive, understand, and recall information best by narrative means. So if you have a people who don't really understand their Bibles very well, maybe they can't read or write, or maybe they don't uh, uh, have even a Bible in their own language, they're basically um, religious illiterates, and you need to communicate through narrative or storytelling. And this is really effective with, with children, with young people, with indigenous peoples who are totally new to Christianity. I mean, they're basically Christian illiterates. They, they don't understand truth. And so you need to tell them stories, and through those stories, they get the truth, and they understand the principles through the stories. Chronological Bible storying is the best suited for illiterates and functional literates. Chronological Bible storytelling is best suited for the upper category of functional literates and for semi-literates. Literate communicators handle words and writing well, and learn best by means of literate styles, such as outlines, steps, principles, teachings, and expositional presentations. Expository preaching formats are almost singularly suited for literates and highly literate individuals. One of our most favorite preaching methods, the Seventh-day Adventist, is expository. And that's the group we mostly get. We get the, the literate people. We get the people who are already Christians. We get the people who are well-educated. And those individuals, technically, they usually tend to drift in to our church, be more willing to come in because we preach expository, usually sermons, expository sermons and messages. So we're really, we're big teachers, but not big storytellers. And if we're going to win the individuals who maybe don't know the scriptures very well, who maybe don't know Christianity very well, and maybe who can't even read or write, um, we need to be able to tell stories effectively too, to win their hearts. And so when we look around this text, Again, this quote I showed you earlier. There should not be a call to have settled pastors over churches. Individual members are to act and lead and to be led to labor interestedly to carry on efficient missionary work. So this whole presentation today is an introduction to missions. And this is for us now to take and to learn from and to grow from and build off of. This isn't the whole thing. But this is something I'm giving to you as a gift where you can take and build off of and grow off of this and become a great witness for Jesus Christ. Be that member that takes your church to the next level. This is my appeal. Do you want to be that member? Or are you already that member? Take your church to the next level. Be a witness for Christ. Win souls for Him. God bless you and keep you.